remind ourselves of some things. Uh, Re the Revelation. Who is the Revelation about? What's the, what's the real title of the book? Even though someone has put a title on it, what's the real title according to verse 1? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he is the theme of the book. It's the Revelation of Christ. And uh, there are side notes and mentions of of uh, Satan and, and uh, those who are following Satan and things like that and what he'll be up to. But it is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we need to remember that, and we need to be aware of, of what it's all about. And it was written by who? John. It was written by John, and I, I think I mentioned it last week, but he wrote it probably in about 95 AD, and I believe it was the last of the New Testament books written. I believe he was the last living apostle, and uh, he lived to be a ripe old age, and he was on the Isle of Patmos. He was exiled there as a prisoner, basically, and it was not a resort at that time. Someone showed me after church a picture of Patmos in their Bible, and it shows this cruise ship out in the water and a bunch of hotels on the, on the shoreline. I don't even know why they put that picture in the Bible. It, I mean, it, it, it just ruins the idea because that's not what it was when John was there. It was, it was an exile. And, uh, and what, it, what was interesting is that he's out in this island and, and just off, off the coast and, and on the coast and on to the Asia, Asia Minor are these seven churches, Ephesus. And of course we have uh, the Ephesian, the book of Ephesians written to the church in Ephesus. But then there are also these other churches that we're going to look at tonight, some of them. And, uh, and he's writing, uh, God's inspiring him to write to these churches. And so I just answered my question, but who was the book of Revelation written to? To the churches. It was written to the churches. And of course, you've heard me say that the argument is from those who uh, teach a pre-tribulation uh, rapture theory. And of course, this is part of what they have to teach. And I'll explain to you when we get to chapter 4 what they say in all this. And it's pretty goofy. But anyhow, um, they say, well, because after chapter 3, there's no more mention of churches until you get all the way to, ch to chapter 22. And so in between there, chapter 4 to chapter, you know, 21 or whatever, uh, it's, it has to do with the Jews in the tribulation, all right? And I explained to you how that it's just like any other epistle that we have in our New Testament. You have the salutation and greeting at the beginning, and then you have a, a closing salutation at the end. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the, that the personal pronoun of the person is, that it's being addressed to is mentioned in every chapter of, of the book, Okay, and uh, I don't think the book of Corinthians is written that way, but we understand that the whole book is called Corinthians, First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, because that's who it's written to originally. And and uh, by the way, just because it's written to the churches, these seven churches, is it not applicable to us? Are we a church? All right, so it's written to all other churches. Okay, and the reason why I know that is the last verse of chapter two, and we'll talk about that when we get there. But uh, it's written to all of us, just like the First Corinthians and Second Corinthians and Galatians and Philippians. All those books were originally written to the church in Philippi and the church in Ephesus. Or the, but now they're for us to get something out of too, and so they were inspired by God, to, written to literal churches, uh, these seven churches, and they also apply to us as well. One one of the theme verses, probably of the entire. B book and and certainly of chapter one and 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 it opens up with this is verse seven behold he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so amen chapter one verse six ends with an amen chapter one verse seven ends with an amen there's amens booking book ending that verse seven it's an important verse i think it's the theme verse behold he cometh with clouds and it will be secret and the only people that will see him are the believers is that what it says no, every eye shall see him, including they which pierced him. Now, if they which pierced him see him, that means that they're, that they're seeing him after death. Because the people that pierced him literally are, are dead. They've been dead for, for a couple thousand years now. And so we see here that this coming with clouds is the theme. And, uh, and yet, you know, and I saw it this week. I see it all the time, especially right now with all the turmoil going on in our world right now I, I see these well-meaning but misguided christians that keep posting things about the secret rapture and the secret appearing of jesus um you can't find that and, and what i find is christ coming the second time not not 2.1 and you know 2.0 and then 2.5 or or second time and third time but christ coming the second time 
And, uh, and there's places in the Bible, keep your finger in Revelation. Go with me back to 1 John 3, a few pages back. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Because <clears throat> Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Are we looking for a secret rapture or are we looking for Jesus just to appear? It says in Acts chapter 1, he'll come back in the same manner that he went. How did he go up into heaven? In the clouds. And it says in Acts chapter 1 that the angel said to his disciples, he'll, he'll, as, as he went up, so he'll come back. In, in like manner, he will, he will descend from those clouds and, he will, and we will see him. All right, we'll be caught up with him in the air. That's true, but we will be with him in the clouds. All right, and so uh, go with me to another place that I, I think of. Two other places: Titus, chapter two, Titus chapter two, and uh, verse eleven. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I consider the blessed hope and the glorious appearing to be the same event. I've seen people break that in half and say the blessed hope is the secret rapture and the glorious appearing is when he comes back. I've seen people do that. And, and I, I, unless someone did that, you would not get that reading that. Okay, you wouldn't get that naturally just reading that from the word. Uh, and so I'm looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then look with me over in Hebrews, backing up a little bit again, Hebrews chapter number nine, Hebrews chapter nine and uh, verse uh, number, um, uh, let's see here, where do I want to start? Hebrews chapter nine and verse number 27, as is appointed a man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him, shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. I mean, that's just it. I mean, that's, that's the completion of everything. And, and so this idea that he's going he's gonna to appear privately to his own, uh, no, I don't believe so. I don't think so. Um, I read you. I read from a, a, a Spurgeon sermon, and I'm not saying that Spurgeon was right about everything, but I, I, I know a lot of people worship Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and I, I read from that on purpose because even he said, and he indicated in that sermon that I have a couple copies of, uh, that chapter 1 of verse 7, Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1. And verse 8, I'm just doing a little rehearse, rehearsal of last week as we get going here. Acts 1 and verse 8, and uh, let's just go up from verse 8 and, and uh, verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they were beheld, he was taken up in a cloud, received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. We mentioned that a minute ago. But verse 8 says, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You know what? That's going to take a while. To be a witness to, to every corner of the globe is going to take a while. That means I don't believe that the rapture was imminent in their minds. They were going to be witnesses in Jerusalem. They were going to be witnesses in Judea. They are going to be witnesses in Samaria. And then they are going to be witnesses into the uttermost part of the earth. That's going to take some time to get that done. Would you not agree? And so I don't believe that that, that shows an imminent, as they like to say, they love to say imminent. It's imminent. It's come, any moment. It's imminent. Now listen, God can do anything. I agree with that. But this idea that it's imminent is not found in the scripture. You've got to put it there yourself. There's no verse that they can point to that proves it. Quickly, yes. It'll be instantaneously. Like lightning, sure. In the blink of an eye, twinkling of an eye, absolutely. But not necessarily imminent like they like to say. Can he? Could he? Absolutely he could if he wanted to. But I can tell you two men in the Bible, Paul and Peter, both said, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. And uh, my time is at hand. I'm about to die. He didn't consider the imminent rapture to be his rescue. 
He said, I'm willing to be offered, he, and, he, and he was. Nero cut his head off. Peter said the same thing. The Lord has shown me that I'm going to put off my tabernacle. I'm going to die a certain type of death, and Peter did. He was also martyred and executed, and we, history says upside down. Peter did not say, I'm hoping for the imminent return of Christ before I have to die my martyr death. No. And so I don't believe that either Peter or Paul uh, were rec waiting for an imminent return of Christ, but they were instead recognizing certain events that would have to happen first. And then at the end of Revelation chapter 1, well, there are a couple things. In verse 8, you have the Alpha and Omega beginning and the end. And uh, in verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Have the keys of hell and of death. And then verse 19 of Revelation 1, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The things which thou hast seen, past, the things which are, present, and the things which shall be hereafter. And then verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks are the, the, which thou sawest are the seven churches. And we talked about how angels, messenger, I believe in this case, the angel is not necessarily as we think of angels from heaven, but, but mess, God's messengers, preachers, and uh, they're in God's hand. And the seven candlesticks represent the seven churches. There's symbolis, and symbolism here, and uh, there's symbolic meaning here, but we understand. We're talking... John's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about physical, literal things in, in, in the sense of human eye can see. Uh, but I would say, I guess I would say spiritually, things are more literal than we think they are. But now let's go to chapter 2, verse 1. So he starts to talk to these seven churches and addressing them individually. I mentioned how that Schofield and another guy, Clar uh, uh, Clarence Larkin, made charts. And they tried to say that the seven churches represent time periods of history. Uh, and I think that's a, 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 a poor choice of using this. Now, I will say this. The seven churches are literal churches. Back then, they were in Asia Minor. None of them exist today. But I do believe that the messages given to the churches were for them literally, but there was also symbolic meaning behind the messages, and we can take those messages and apply them to us today as we're going to right now. But the idea that they represented certain time periods or ages. And then you'll hear this term, the church age. I'm sure you've heard that before, the church age. Well, I don't even like that term because the church age gives you the impression that the church comes to an end. The church doesn't come to an end. Matthew 16, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And uh, Ephesians at the end of chapter, I believe it's chapter two, no, chapter three, Ephesians chapter 3, I'm going to read this one to you. Ephesians 3 and verse 21, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout how many ages? All ages. World without end. Do you know that in all ages there will be glory in the church? I don't like the universal church idea because I don't think it applies today. I believe that we are to practice local church, just like we're going to read about the local church in Ephesus, the local church in Smyrna, the local church of Pergamos. We're going to read about literal churches, local churches. However, when he calls all of his people, all of his saints, all of the saved from all around the world, when they're gathered together, that will be the universal assembly, okay? The general assembly, as Hebrew says. And, and yet, even then, the church will still go on. We'll all, we'll all transfer our membership from Custer Church to the church, all right? And until then, we practice local church, okay? All right, so uh, I reject that concept and, uh, and reject that idea that, because the reason why is it's a defeated attitude, and I'll tell you more about that at the end of chapter 3. But tonight, chapter 2, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. And by the way, I'm not locked into it being the pastor. If you want to say there's actually an, uh, an angel that was hovering over this church, that's fine. Uh, if that's what you want to think, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to argue that. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, 
who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Ephesus, I'm writing to you to tell you there's some good things about you. You've got some good qualities. And pastor of the church of Ephesus, I'm letting you know there's some good qualities in your church. Uh, they, they, uh, Ephesus was where the, the temple of Diana had been located in Acts 19 and Acts 20. Uh, they can't stand the evil and the false apostles. And I hope that you and I will always be aware of false apostles, these apostles and these false prophets, these guys that are on Fox News TV and they have a real smiley, teethy grin. And they got like this mega church like in Houston, Texas, you know, with this with this huge Astrodome sized building. Uh, and they preach a false gospel and they write books about your best life now instead of your best life in eternity, stuff like that. Uh, I, I'm talking about false apostles that you and I should recognize and people like Joseph Smith who started the 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 uh, church, the Mormon church and, the, and wrote the Book of Mormon uh, and, and whatnot and, and other false religions and false doctrines that are out there. And I hate that stuff. And, and uh, Ephesus, they hated it too. They did not tolerate that. They did not appreciate that. Uh, they couldn't stand that. And it says that they, they labored, they worked, they, they had patience. And uh, they can't bear them which are evil and has tried them which say that are apostles and are not and found them to be liars. And has borne and has patience, all right? I, I, those are the good things, the good qualities about them. Verse number five, or verse number four says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. They had left their first love. They had just kind of fallen back from what they used to be and they were no longer as, as focused as they were in the past. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse two, looking unto Jesus, the author of, and finisher of our faith. You know what can happen to a church? And, and this is why we can apply ourselves to all these different churches that we're reading about. It's easy for us to get focused on an agenda, to get focused on something. And churches, it happens a lot. Uh, churches become focused and centered on something. And it might be a good, it might be a good thing, but it's not necessarily the right thing. It's not necessarily the focus on Christ as it ought to be. And it's easy. For instance, a church can be completely consumed with tr trying to eradicate uh, the abortion clinic in their town and get it out of their town. Well, that's a good cause. But you know what? It's easy to take your eyes off the Lord to fight some, a battle. And it's important that we don't take our eyes off Christ in the middle of fighting a certain battle. And it's easy for churches to do stuff like, like, and I'm just picking that as an example. I'm not saying that's the only example. There's other things out there, but it's easy for that to happen. And it says somehow, even though they had some great qualities, they had left their first love. Come on in, you guys. You don't have to stay out there. Come on and find a seat. And we're glad you're here. Uh, and so in verse number four, I have someone against it because thou hast left thy first love. John chapter 14, verse 15 says this, if you love me, keep my commandments. And so it's important that if we love the Lord, that we're keeping the word of God. What happens if you, if you, if you start fighting false apostles and people that are preaching a false doctrine, blah, 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 and you get all wound up about this false doctrine, but you know what? You got to remember to keep the commandments yourself. It's easy when, when you, let me just use this as an example. I think it becomes a little bit easier to slip into sin when you are when you are surrounded by and you're fighting against homosexuality against the the queers and I don't like to use gay cuz they're not gay and you start fighting that cause and you start taking up issue with that and you start to really fight against it well then what happens is is that let's say there's fornication in your church there's a girl and a boy that's just started doing things and living together, whatever. And you tolerate that because after all, that's not nearly as bad as that homo stuff, right? You see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? But the truth is they're both wrong. And we, we tolerate 
some things because they're not as bad and not as egregious and not as abominable as other things, but they're still wrong. And uh, I, I think I think those are just examples here. But we see this church leaving its first love. Now, one more thing I think I should bring up, and and that is what was, I mean, the first love is who? Who is the first love? Jesus Christ. And getting away from Christ, taking our eyes off of the Lord and starting to do good things rather than what he wants us to do. We, do, we find these good things to do, but they're not necessarily God's will for our life. And so taking our eyes off Christ and, and po- focusing on other things. What's the main thing of Jesus Christ? When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and you read the other Gospels, and the other Testament, New Testament scriptures, what's the main desire? What's the purpose of Jesus Christ? Salvation of the, the people. Salvation of humankind. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. What did he say at the end of Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20? What did he say? He said, go ye into all the world. He said, you shall be, you shall, well, let me read it because I'm getting Mark 16 mixed up with Matthew 28. So let me just read it so I don't confuse myself. Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach them what? Teach them economics? Teach them about salvation. Teach them the gospel. Mark 16, 15. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He did not say at the end when he was leaving the earth. What did he say in Acts chapter 1? We read it tonight. Verse 8. You will be witnesses about the gospel, about me. He didn't say, go into all the world and build food banks and salvation army centers where you give out clothing and free stuff. Now, are those bad things? They're not bad things, but that's not the first love. You see what I'm saying here tonight? You see what happened to this church in Ephesus? They just kind of got, and, and, and I'm not picking on them because we do it too. In fact, I'm not sure how many people in here are doing the first love and the first works. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how many people are witnessing. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to use this as an example, but today I was able to lead someone to the Lord, okay? I wasn't the only one that had a part in that, Okay? I think other people had a part in that. But when's the last time that you that you shared the gospel with someone and they prayed with you to God for salvation and you saw them saved? That's the first work, see? And he's saying, you, you, you're fighting a lot of stuff here and you're doing some good stuff, but, but nevertheless, I have someone against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of this pl- out of his place, except thou repent. And you know what? They don't exist anymore. They, they no longer are a church. They stop doing the first works. They still were doing good works for a while. In verse 6, thou hast this, thou hast, thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. We'll talk about that more in a minute. He that hath ear and ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, the tree of life, it, at the end of the book of Revelation, it dwells in the paradise of God. Paradise is heaven. And, uh, the tree of life was banned from Adam and Eve from participating, eating that, because it's it has to do with eternal life. So when it says, he that overcometh, who's the overcomer? Who are the overcomers? The saved. The saved are the people who are the overcomers. Look at chapter 3 in verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Back up to First John again. Chapter 5, 1 John chapter 5, and verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. 
It is the believer that overcomes. We don't overcome by ourselves. I think it's chapter 12 of Revelation. Chapter 12 of Revelation, I think it's verse 11 or 12. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. You're an overcomer when you're saved. You have the ability to overcome uh, and be an overcomer. And so he that overcometh the saved, you know, it's possible to be a part of a church on earth and not truly be saved. You shouldn't be, but it's possible to be allowed in. But he that overcometh. And so there was the Ephesus church. Now, verse 8, Revelation 2, 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Well, who's that? That's Jesus. He's, he just keeps referring to himself in different ways so we know who it is. Verse 9, I know thy works in tribulation. By the way, John in, in chapter 1 said he was a companion with them in tribulation. These people are having tribulation. Um, Smyrna, the name comes from myrrh and uh, the idea of suffering and, uh, and, and the, a fragrance that is, that is related to uh, uh, suffering and death. And I know thy works, tribulation, poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. See, that overcomer has to do with salvation. I was showing Miss Janet earlier this morning about, earlier today, about how that the second death is hell. If you're saved, you're an overcomer. If you're saved, you overcome by the blood of Christ. And you miss the second death. You miss hell. And so he's, he's warning them, listen, be careful. I know that you're, you do some good things. I know there's things here uh, about you that are, are wonderful. But, but understand some things here. Uh, you are dealing with the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Um. <clears throat> so who's that about the synagogue of Satan it mentions it again in chapter 3 verse 9 it mentions it again it says behold I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie who's the synagogue of Satan boy who could, who could that be who could that be let's see here um well, uh, what, what, what religion, what religion uses synagogues? What religion uses synagogues? Uh, uh, I can only think of one. How about you? Who would call themselves Jews, but not truly be Jews? All right. Um, let me tell you who R Romans chapter number two, Romans chapter number two. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. We, taught what, we dealt with Ephesus and how that they say they were false apostles. Now we're looking at people who say they are Jews and they are not. Who is a true Jew who are saved? The circumcision of the heart. Someone said the Catholics believe they're the true Jews. That's true. They believe in a replacement theology. The problem with that is, is that they're not saved either. There's something called British Israelism. They believe that the white race is the lost tribes of Israel. And it, and, it, and because, now think about this. The, the Anglo-Saxons migrated northeast into Europe and into England and into Great Britain and then eventually sailed to America. And so uh, their, their theory is, is that the lost tribes are the white race people and they are the, the lost tribes of Israel. Here's the problem with that. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God doesn't matter what skin color you are. It doesn't matter if you're Abraham's child. If you're not born again, 
Jesus said to a man in John chapter 3, you're a ruler of the Jews, but I'm telling you, you must be what? Born again. You need to be circumcised in the heart. You're not a Jew outwardly. Circumcision is not what makes you a Jew outwardly in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Our circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. That's not fair, Pastor. You can't be quoting those verses to match with synagogue of Satan. Why? You got a better, you got a better explanation for Revelation chapter 2 verse 9? I, right now, there are people all over that would say that what I said was anti-Semitic. Can I tell you something? It wouldn't matter if it was the Chinese or the Mexicans. It wouldn't matter if it was the South Dakotans or the North Dakotans. If the Bible said that these people are false, these people are not truly the true Jews that I'm talking about, God says, then I would point them out. I'm so frustrated. I really am. Uh, the Bible says the synagogue of Satan, which say there are Jews that are not, but are, are liars. Look with me in 1 John chapter number 2. 1 John chapter 2. You say, well, you sound racist. I am not racist. Let's say this. Let's say that really I have a lot of Jewish blood in me, and I don't even know it. And honestly, I don't even care to know it. It doesn't matter. It literally doesn't matter. But let's say I did. Does that make me any better than anybody else? Absolutely not. It gives me no heads up on anybody. God is no respecter of persons. Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4 totally straightens out this. But 1 John chapter 2, it says, Little children, it is the last time. As ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists. Thereby we know it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Let me ask you a question. Was John, and by the way, John, 1 John, was written by the same guy who wrote Revelation. Was John dealing and battling with Mormons? No, they didn't, they didn't exist back then. How about Jehovah's Witnesses? Who, who, who then would have been antichrists who were among them but not of them? Who persecuted the Christians in the book of Acts over and over again? Okay? And so he says here in verse 21, verse 22, Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. There's an interesting thing about Antichrist that we need to understand. First of all, the Bible never calls anyone the Antichrist. There are many Antichrists. All right? Uh, man has termed a certain individual as being the Antichrist and make, make him to be some sort of a villainous hero. But what is Antichrist? Anti is, is instead of a, a, a replacement for Christ. It's also someone who's opposed to Christ. It means both things. And in order to be anti-Christ, you have to believe that there really is a Christ, but it isn't Jesus Christ. Now, who out there right now believes there really is a Messiah and he is coming, but it isn't Jesus? There's only one individual group that fits all this, okay? And when I read Synagogue of Satan, that's a big clue. And when they say they're Jews, but they're not, that's a big clue. And when Jesus says you must be born again, that's a big clue. And it says here in verse number 23 and 22, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Well, they don't deny the Father. They, they're, their God is the same God as our God. Look at verse 23. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father he that acknowledged this, the son hath the father. So that doesn't work either. And there are many people in churches today, in America especially, who think that the Jews are God's chosen people. And that the Jews worship the same God you and I do. 
they don't because that verse says they don't. If they deny Jesus Christ, they don't have the Father. That's plain. Look at first, Second John. Look at Second John. And verse number 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. There it is. If you don't have Christ, you don't have God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. And if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Earlier this week, a well-meaning pastor, but a pastor who is misguided on all this because of a lot of misinterpretation of scripture, and that's why we're teaching all this, posted and said, and I told you about this about a month ago, that Ted Cruz has, has put, put forth a bill that we will remove our dependency of medication and our dependency for medical needs from China to Israel. And we will allow Israel to be the ones who take care of our medical needs and medical sciences. And there was lots of comments, lots of likes, some hearts, you know. And I just said, I didn't comment, I didn't, like or any unlike, I just said, out of the fi frying pan, dot, dot, dot. So there was a pastor in our local area, not here in the Black Hills, but in this western area that, what do you mean by that? I, out of the fi frying pan into the fire. What do you mean by that? I said, well, and I tried, to, I tried to just answer the question without getting into an argument. I just said, because we Americans should be taking care of Americans. We shouldn't have foreign countries making our medical stuff. Why don't we Americans make our own medical stuff? How about that for a change? But that logic's gone out the window. You know? And, yeah, yeah, but that's not really answering my question. Okay. Well, because we're not going to be any better off. But I know why this post is being posted. And I know why you're upset. Because you think that going from China to Israel is a, it, I mean, because they're God's people. They're like us. They're on, we're on the same team. This is going to be wonderful. And, uh, I, and I said, I just don't agree with that. I don't think that, and, um, you know, I don't think that, that the, they, they're wonderful and that we're going to be. And, and then they said this, don't you understand that if we bless Israel, we'll be blessed? I said, please, show me the verse in the Bible that, that says that. Show me the verse that says if we bless Israel, we'll be blessed. And they spouted off all these references. I said, no, no, don't give me references. Just, just copy and paste or type out a verse or a couple verses that tells me what you just said. Because Genesis chapter 12 says that I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And God was talking to Abraham. Thee is singular. And this preacher that I was talking with, he's King James. And I said, King James English, the these are important. The means singular. So, so you can't use that one. I said, of course, and I know this guy. I know him well enough to know that he has, he has a King James Bible, but it's a Schofield King James Bible. I said, your King James Bible in Genesis chapter 12 has notes under it that says, God promises to bless the descendants of Abraham. I said, the notes at the bottom of your Bible say descendants but God's word didn't say descendants. Galatians 3, verse 16, clears it up when it says, God didn't say seeds. He said seed. And that one seed was Christ. And I said, when we, when we as a nation, America, just like in the Old Testament, the people who blessed singular Abraham, they were blessed. The people who befriended Abraham were blessed for it. And the people who cursed Abraham paid for it. And just like that, the people back in the day when America blessed the singular seed of Abraham, Jesus Christ, we were blessed. This nation used to bless the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were blessed back then. I said, but since 1948, our nation's not better. 
We're not, we're not a better nation. And he even, he even brought up abortion and sodomy. He said, in spite of our issues and abortion and sodomy, you know, God still can, is blessing us if we'll keep supporting Israel. And, and I said, I said let, me, let, me, let me explain something to you. Because I could tell he, doesn't, he didn't know this, but he didn't like what I was telling him. And I said, I said, listen, I said, we give America right now gives $11 million to Israel every day. Look at the blessings in our economy that we have right now for it. Look at the protection. I said, you mentioned abortion and sodomy. Did you know that since 1948 until today, Israel, the modern state of Israel, has always had what we call Obamacare, socialized medicine. And just in the last five or ten years, they have decided that abortions are free to anyone who wants one. And we give them $11 million a day. And there's a huge hypocrisy going on in Washington, D.C. with the conservatives who don't want to talk about that when they know their constituents are very opposed to abortion. I said, you also mentioned the sodomy in America. Did you know that Tel Aviv brags to be the gay capital of the world? And I said, is that who you support? Is that what you, when you say you support Israel, does, is that what you mean? Well, no, 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 of course not. But we, we, we got to bless them. Now, now, let me read you again what Second John says right here. It says, those who deny Christ don't have God and they are antichrist. That makes sense. And then it says here, verse 10, 2 John 10, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So if you're, if you're bidding Israel and the Jews God's speed, then, and, and, you're, and you're supporting them, I say you're partaking of their evil deeds. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, especially those listening through, through the recording, we support a missionary in Israel right now. And our desire is for him to preach the gospel. And I hope and pray that he is preaching the gospel over there. We trust that he is. We believe that he understands that's his job. But we support the preaching of the gospel to Israel and to anyone. We support the preaching of the gospel to the Arabs. The preaching of the gospel to the Chinese and the Japanese and everybody on planet Earth. We are not anti-Semitic. We're not anti-anybody. But we're also not blindly supporting someone who is anti-Christ. There's one thing. Preaching the gospel to someone is not the same thing as supporting them. Financially and wherever else, every other way. Now, back there in Revelation chapter 2. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. It was blasphemy to deny Jesus Christ and yet call themselves Jew. Which say they are Jews or not, but of the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, fear none of those things which shall... Thou so, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation 10 days. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Let me, let me just stop here for a minute. This is the third time we've read the word tribulation and we're only in chapter two. Tribulation is something that came upon the churches 2000 years ago. Tribulation is trouble, and usually it's trouble from the world and Satan towards God's people and his churches. That's what tribulation is. And, and then also I want to explain something else. Remember how we said that they like to say that, that chapter 4 all the way to chapter whatever is just for the Jews. And the tribulation that the, the tribulation saints the Jews. And, and the first part was to the church and the last part's for the church, but the middle section's not to the church. And the reason why we know that is because the church is not mentioned in chapter four all the way till you get to the end. 
But did you know the only two times? If, if, if the whole tribulation, the whole quote-unquote pretend seven-year tribulation is, is for the Jews, if that's really true, then why is it that the only two times in the Bible, in the, in the book of Revelation, that Jew or Jews is mentioned is 2-9 and 3-9, and it both refers to them as the synagogue of Satan? It's not for the Jews, as, as, as they say it. Okay, God is saying, you want to be on my side, you follow Jesus Christ. We don't have a separate salvation for this group of people who are rebelling to Jesus Christ. You need to be born again just like anyone else. And there have been Jews that have been born again. Our vacation Bible school, we do a, a whole week of a story on a guy named Solomon Ginsburg who was a Jew who got saved. There are Jews who've gotten born again. We support a guy in Israel right now who got born again, who was a true Jew, you know, was a born, born Jew physically, and then a born again Jew and a true Jew. And we support him. We, listen, there are Jews who get saved. This is not about anti-Jew. This is about separating falsehood and false doctrine from truth. And a lot of people will say, see, Matt Furs is an anti-Semitic. Oh, you know, I just... Do you not read your Bible? What's wrong with you? But that's what they do. And, and you know what? I, I, I cringe at that term. Who wants to be called that in today's world? But notice Satan tries these people. Satan gets after these people as they stand up to this stuff. And uh, they, 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 they're fighting that. And they're being faithful to death. Now, there's, a, there's a, something in here. I can't just go over it without saying something. It says, verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, I will give thee a crown of life. I believe that that literally was a message to the church in Smyrna. But I also think there's, sim symbolic, there's something symbolic here. There's some symbolism here. I think the 10 days has a symbolic meaning to it. And I don't think it's wrong to say this, and, and it, it's not so important that you agree with me on it one way or the other. But you remember two months ago on March 8th, I taught on the feasts, the seven feasts. And I taught how the, the spring feasts are already done, prophetically speaking. But the fall feasts have not happened yet, prophetically speaking. You say, what are you talking about? Well... If you go back to March 8th, we didn't have it on video, but we had it on audio. You can listen again. But let me just quickly say this to you. In Leviticus chapter 23, it lists all seven feasts in one chapter. And it, it talks about the different feasts that are there. And, and the first four feasts is the feast, the Passover. And then, of course, who was, who was crucified and died at the Passover? Jesus Christ. Then right the next day after the Passover is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then the, the Feast of the First Fruits. And of course, that all has picture and symbol, symbolism as well as, as Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. The unleavened bread, as we, we still celebrate and recognize communion and, and the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper. The first fruits, uh, <clears throat> the idea of being the first fruits, the resurrection of the dead and rising from the grave. And then the Feast of Weeks, which was 49 days or seven weeks long. And then the, the 50th day was, was uh, or excuse me, the 40th day was the the. Pentecost, the, the Feast of Weeks, the 40 days of Pentecost. I got that a little bit confused, sorry. Those four things symbolically have already happened because Christ was our Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, he rose from the grave. And then Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, the Holy Spirit came. Those things have already happened. Those are done events. But the fall feasts, those feasts that happen later in the year, not in the spring, but in the fall, what we would call September, October, those haven't happened yet. The first one on the docket is called the Feast of, anybody know? The Feast of Trumpets. 
the Feast of Trumpets. Go with me to Le Leviticus chapter 23, and we'll just quickly pick this up because I just want to show you something that goes with Revelation chapter 2. And I don't want to bore you, but I want to show you something that I think is something unique and something we'll come back to later on as we study Revelation. But Revelation chapter 23, <clears throat> we have here the first of those fall feasts in the seventh month. And again, if you go back and listen to March 8th, you'll understand this clearer by matching this with tonight. Leviticus chapter 23, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also... On the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be an holy convocation unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in the, that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, the Feast of Trumpets starts on the first day of the seventh month. Or it's called Tishri. Ten days later, there is the Day of Atonement as the last trumpet is blown. You have the Feast of Trumpets, or what they call Rosh Hashanah, and then you have the 10 days that they call the Days of Awe, and you have then on the 10th day, the Day of Atonement, or what they call Yom Kippur. Kippur. Now, I don't have you turn there right now, but Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17 says that these feasts are a shadow of things to come. That's why we look at these feasts, because they are a shadow of future events. And what I'm trying to tell you is, symbolically, you have the Feast of Trumpets, then you have the Day of Atonement. And on the Day of Atonement, it happens to be the 10th day. And what did Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 say? You'll have tribulation 10 days. And if you'll read and go, if you'll follow with us in Revelation, you'll find that the trumpets in Revelation are the tribulation. You have the first trumpet, the second trumpet, the third trumpet, the fourth trumpet, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet. And when you get to the seventh trumpet in Revelation, the mystery of God is finished and the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. And oh, by the way, the seventh trumpet is the last trumpet. But there's one more thing. In Leviticus 23, it tells us it's the day of atonement, Yom Kippur. I, I want to also tell you that traditionally, and this is sad because they, they've got the truth in front of their face, but they don't know it. Traditionally, Jewish tradition is that the 10-day period from Rosh Hashanah, day one of Tishrei, to day 10 of Tishrei, the tradition says that they recognize those two high and holy days of Judaism as the days of awe. And these 10 days are believed to be their last chance to repent before God's judgment is finalized. It's there in their own traditions. You see, I believe that the tribulation period is a time where God's people can be witnessing and saying, it's right here. And someone said to me, oh, this stuff scares me. Listen, my flesh doesn't like tribulation either. But let me tell you right now, tribulation worketh patience and tribulation gives opportunity to witness and share the gospel with people. And I would love before I died to pull out the scriptures and show a Jew, look, he loved you so much. He, he warned you in your own scriptures in Leviticus. He warned you that it's coming. Can't you see what's happening here? The seventh seal starts the seven trumpets. And when that seventh trumpet sounds, it's gone. The, the, the end of everything, the mystery of God is finished. Now, not only that, but Leviticus chapter 25 tells us one more thing about the day of atonement. In Leviticus 25 <clears throat> and verse 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. This is what I had gotten mixed up earlier with Pentecost, I'm sorry. And verse 9, thou shalt cause 
the trumpet of the jubilee to sound in the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So not only is that trumpet that's going to sound on the 10th day of Jubilee, Jubilee was when all debts were paid, when all slaves were released, when all land was returned to its rightful owner. Do you see the picture here? Jubilee. And it says, and ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. You shall proclaim liberty. When, when that trumpet sounds, and the dead in Christ rise, and we are gathered up with them, it's liberty. We have it on our Liberty Bell over in Philadelphia, but we don't have liberty. But true liberty and freedom and, and freedom from enslavement and freedom from the bondage of sin and corruption and the disease and, and frustration and all of that. It's over the Jubilee trumpet sounds. Aren't you looking forward to the sound of the Jubilee trumpet? I think the Jubilee trumpet and the last trumpet are the same trumpet. We'll talk more of that when we get to Revelation chapter 8. And I, I just wanted to bring that out to you because I think symbolically, now I think literally there probably was a 10-day tribulation period for the people in Smyrna back then. But symbolically, I think God is also showing us something for us to see today. Now we go back to Revelation chapter 2 and let's quickly finish it tonight. Revelation chapter 2. And verse... Number 12, and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, these things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. What, what, who is that? That's Jesus. And what is the sharp sword? His word. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. This place called Pergamos was a place that they, that, Jesus is saying, this is Satan's seat. This is where Satan dwells. I don't know what was going on in Pergamos, but that's what Jesus said. He said, this is Satan's seat is here. This is where he dwells. See, Satan's not omnipresent like God is. I mean, that ought to make us just shudder to think. This church was facing, this church had Satan close by, not just the devil's. And it's where this man Antipas was one of the faithful martyrs who was slain where Satan dwelleth. Verse 14, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. If you go back and read in the book of Numbers about Balaam, he, he, he devised a plan to infiltrate Israel with getting the guys to marry unsaved girls, to getting the girls to mess around with unsaved guys. And you know what? That still happens, doesn't it? That still goes, uh, you know, divide and conquer. And, 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 you know, girls just talk the Christian language and just, and just talk the good talk. Guys just talk it and fool those girls and vice versa. And uh, they commit fornication. And they eat things they ought not be eating. Whatever all that was. Sacrificed unto idols. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate. And Nico means to conquer. And laity is the people. To conquer the people. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly. And I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth he that hath an ear let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh i will give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth saving he that receiveth it and unto the angel of the church in thyatira write these things saith the son of god who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brass i know thy works and thy charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. 
Behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their, e their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you, I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as I have not, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already hold fast till I come. We know Jezebel from the Old Testament. She had evil deeds and evil ways, but she had infiltrated this church in Thyatira, and she had allowed, and, and through her, they had allowed things to happen that should not have happened. Do you think 2,000 years later things are different now and Satan doesn't do this kind of stuff? Do you think there's a Jezebel spirit that enters churches? Absolutely. Do you think there's, there's wrong spirits that enter churches and, and, and satanic attack? Absolutely. There are, there are churches that are, fight all this stuff that we're reading about tonight. They, they're put up with it all the time. This kind of stuff happens. But he says, those of you who are still intact, be faithful. Hold fast till I come, verse 25. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Did you know that you and I that are saved, we're going to have opportunity to rule and reign over nations? Right now, I can barely rule my checkbook. How about you? But God's going to give us, if we're faithful to him and we're serving him and... He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Thou have been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. As the vessels of potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. Jesus Christ is the morning star. Chapter 22 says, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I think when it keeps saying that, like it says in verse 29, it's saying, hey, you, hey, you and Custer, you have an ear. You hear what the Spirit said to those churches back then. Hey, you all that are reading Revelation 1,015 and 1,800 years after it was written, you, if you have an ear, listen to what the Spirit's saying to the churches. Listen to what it's saying. Ephesus, you're a good church. You've done wonderful things, but you're slowly you slowly took your eyes off the Lord and you've less left your first love and you're not doing the first works anymore. You're satisfied with your crowd that you have, but you're not reaching others with the gospel. You're not soul winning and winning others to the Lord and seeing people saved and baptized and added to the church. You left your first love. Oh, I think there's a lot of churches out there that have to deal with the synagogue of Satan. I, know, I, don't, I don't think you and I have ever met an actual Nicolaitan. We read about it from 2,000 years ago, right? Uh, you know. But you know what? The, there is, Judaism still exists. And there are people who say they are Jews, but they are not circumcised in heart. And there are churches who literally worship anything with the star of David on it. My family has visited churches. I've gone into a church on vacation and up in front was an American flag, a Christian flag, and then a Jewish flag, a star of David flag. And they think that that's going to bless them. I mean, they, we support them. Look, you're not, you're not doing yourself any favors if you're trying to reach the Arab nations if you're showing favoritism towards this other nation, when neither nation worships the true God. You're, you're confusing. And you're not getting any blessings from the Lord. That star of David is not the star of David. It's the star of Remphan, Acts 7 says. It has nothing to do with David. David probably never saw the star of David. And we're gonna go into this, not because I want to, not because I have an anti-Semitic spirit, but because Revelation shows us who the whore of Babylon is. Did you know that synagogues did not really get started until after the Babylonian captivity? Do you recall God telling Moses to start synagogues?
There's a church out in Montana. I was there once on vacation. They had a great big Star of David flag out in front of their church, you know. And and, and I know they, they all mean what they think this, but it's like a, it's like this talisman or this this relic that's supposed to bring some kind of favoritism to them. I heard last year that that pastor is no longer pastoring that church because of adultery. <laughs> this week, I saw a headline that got my attention. It was it was by someone who is pre-trib, and they think that, that the Jews are special people and they're, they have a special place. They only have a special place if they get saved. But, but this person posted this news report because they said, I'm so surprised. Benjamin Netanyahu, Bibi, I, you know, I, I think that God's with him. But if he, if, he, if he denies Jesus Christ, God's not with him. Bibi said this week that he thinks it would be a good idea if all the children in Israel got some kind of a microchip planted in their skin keep track of the coronavirus some of the others said well i don't think that's a good idea what's going to happen folks is that people who don't know their bible but who have who have swallowed the lie of satan are going to follow a people that are not even christians and, I, and i'm and i'm trying to warn everybody against that i'm trying to warn you what's coming and stay with me, because when we get to the later chapters of Revelation, I'll show you how we know what is false and what is true. And you hang on to the Word of God, and you let it be the, 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 the common denominator, the, the fixed point of reference. But it's interesting to me <clears throat> that way back when Revelation was being written down on, on parchment, there was a synagogue of Satan and there were people who said they were Jews, but they weren't truly Jews according to the word of God. And it is no different today. Here we are today. We're seeing it. We're seeing it coming back to life in front of our eyes. And I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I do think that the way America is going, we no longer bless Jesus Christ. We give Israel $11 million a day, but we don't bless Jesus Christ. And what we're seeing is, is we're seeing a shift. And I'll just give you a little peek into some later Re Revelation chapters. I believe that, that there's a woman and she rides the beast. Which is more powerful, the beast or the woman? Which has more muscular power, the beast or the woman? The beast, right? I mean, if you were sitting on top of a horse, which would have more muscle, you or the horse? There's a woman that rides the beast when we get to Re Revelation chapters later on. But now let me ask you a question. Who has, the more, who, who has more of the brain and the control, the woman or the beast? The woman. The rider controls the horse. At least it's supposed to, right? Rider's supposed to control the horse. The woman rides the beast. I'll just give you a little snippet into future Revelation chapters. I think America's the beast, and I think the woman controls her. The woman infiltrates her Washington, D.C. lobbying and controls the political decisions that are made and makes sure that funding is coming their way to the point where Ted Cruz, that Christian senator, says, I think I've got an idea. Don't you think somebody's kicking Ted Cruz a little kickback for that? Don't you think there's a little something showing up on Ted's porch for doing that? The woman rides the beast. She's not as strong as the beast. But she controls. That's where we're headed. So you've got Ephesus, you've got Smyrna, you've got Pergamos, where Satan's seat is. When I think of Satan's seat where Satan dwells, I think of Hollywood, Washington, D.C. I mean, we're blessed. We're, we're having church tonight. There are churches that are celebrating the idea of having a parking lot service soon. There's churches in Illinois that are excited because next week they're going to have church for the first time in, in two months. We're blessed here. But you know, there's some churches, they're, they're right outside of Hollywood. They're, they're right outside of, uh, of 
D.C. or they're right outside of some wicked places and some, and, and we, we're not experiencing that here, right here. There's people that contacted me this week and said, are there any jobs in South Dakota? I want to move to South Dakota. And some of us are selfishly saying, no, there are no jobs here. Stay away. But Thyatira, they were the church that had to deal with the Jezebel influence. Folks, let me give you my heart as a pastor. I'm always concerned about the infiltration of a wrong spirit into our church. I don't want a wrong spirit in our church, not because I don't like people, but because I can't stand to see what a wrong spirit can do to a church. And let me tell you something. We're slowly seeing good things happening. We're seeing people get saved. We're seeing people get saved and drive all the way from Wall, South Dakota. Who ever heard of that? We're going to show you some report in the financial statement. We got a problem. We have too much money. We're not giving away as much money as we have coming in for our missionaries. That's a great problem, isn't it? But let's not brag about it. Let's recognize that, that Satan would love to divide and conquer, and he would love to have a spirit of Jezebel and a spirit of, of rebellion and a spirit of saying, come on, let's just do it our way. Let's just, I, I, let's just you know, just, just imagine, what if, what if one of my sons fell in love with this quote-unquote Christian girl who was worldly, who was not right, who was not God's will for them? brought her to church and he's flirting with her and fooling around with her and all this sort of thing. Would that mess up things around here? And spiritually speaking, James chapter 4 says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Don't be a friend of the world. Get rid of the worldliness and the things in your life that are, that are hindering you that are not godly. Trash it and get rid of it. Protect yourself and protect the church anyway we're going to stop there we'll pick up chapter three next week